All right. Um, some interesting, potentially hopeful movement, yeah. guys, on the congressional stock trading ban. Let's go ahead and put this insider report up on the screen. So a bipartisan group, 19 lawmakers, laying out three key parameters for a stock trading ban following the House's first hearing on the issue. So important that the House actually had a hearing on reforming the rules around stock ownership in Congress. Um, they are planning to, this bipartisan group is planning to pressure the Committee on House Administration to move forward on an outright ban on stock trading by members of Congress, uh, according to a source with knowledge of the effort. You have uh, Democrats like uh, Jared Golden of Maine, Abigail Spanberger of Virginia, uh, you also have Republicans like Matt Gates of Florida, Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, very odd fellows, kind of a mix of, of folks here. Uh, across the truly across the ideological spectrum too. You got the corporate wing represented, the moderate wing represented. You've got the uh, more progressives represented. You've got you know uh, right wings like uh, Matt Gates represented here as well. And so the three key sticking points that we really wanted to make sure to highlight for you because there are very different directions this bill could go and it could turn into something that's just like sort of the toothless virtue signal that has a million loopholes that people can get out of or you could have something that's actually consequential and actually has a meaningful constraint on members of Congress and what they're able to do. So the first piece that is a point of contention is whether or not to include spouses and dependent children. So there's a lot of different potential bills floating around. Some of them include the spouses and dependent children, people like Nancy Pelosi's uh, husband, Ro Khanna's wife, you know, the uh, adult children who are still dependent. That piece is really important to making this thing ultimately have teeth. Because if the spouses, if the husbands and wives can still trade stock, this ultimately ends up being fairly meaningless because obviously your spouse trade. So right. that's a really important part. And it seems like pressure is building in the direction of making sure that these spouses and dependent children are included. The other one is this question of some people are saying like, oh, the blind trust, this isn't mm -hmm. really fair because it's expensive to set up. And then, you know, I can't be a member of Congress because I can't afford the fees. The vast majority of your millionaires. I don't want to hear it. I yeah. mean, well, yeah. and not to mention, um, and, you know, credit to Abigail Spanberger, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, on this one, she's like, okay, then just sell it. You don't have to put in trust. That's fine. Just divest. No big deal. Um, so that's the other piece is, you know, pushing towards divestment or blind trust. And then the last one in this one also really matters is, okay, let's say you violate the act, then what happens? Are you going to actually give, give this thing some teeth mm -hmm. so that there's a significant fine and real consequences for violating the ban on stock trading because what we've seen with the, the Stock Act, which just requires transparency, which ended up being important because it helped to galvanize public right. pressure around moving further, but when it it's routine that members just don't file the stuff they're supposed to file. Yes. Um, and there's no consequence for it. What's there, there, It's like a $200 fine or something utterly pathetic, and no one seems to really pay attention or ultimately care of very few people. So that's the other piece is making sure this thing has actual teeth so that members have to comply. Right. And also, did you know that there's no public record disclosure required on whether you actually paid the fine? What, what kind of enforcement mechanism that's is this? That's nothing. Ludicrous. Literally nothing. This is what happens whenever they are in charge of regulating themselves. And the only check on it is our public outrage. That's so right. from the beginning, lay out the timeline. Unusual Whales on Twitter begins republishing reports as to how exactly these guys are beating the market, which is crazy because the best paid people on Wall Street routinely do not beat the market. Then we begin talking about it here on our show. It begins to become a meme on, uh, in, on the internet. TikTok gets a hold of it. Gen Z gets really invested within the story. It becomes a groundswell. And eventually what happens is Nancy Pelosi is asked about it after other journalists, jur journalists begin to do investigations into stock trades, bipartisan members of Congress, she says, well, it's a free market, all of that. That was a great moment for us because obviously, she looked like the out of touch, ultra net worth high individual off. that yeah. she is. It was a mask off moment. And the public was like, hey, screw you. You shouldn't be able to trade stocks. This became, I mean, I saw Dave Portnoy talking about it. I saw people on the left talking about it. It became a real piece of the internet zeitgeist. From there, Congress had to begin to respond. John Ossoff introduces a bill. Josh Hawley introduces a bill. There are now 20 separate bills that are working their way through Congress. 
However, the establishment is fighting back in every way that they can. We know that Joe Biden was supposed to have it in the draft vision of his State of the Union was supposed to call for a stock ban on Congress, and it was taken Left, out. Uh, every Nobody other knows freaking why. laundry list, check the box thing yeah. was in that State of the right. Union. Yeah. Somehow oh, that identity got politics. On the cutting room floor. Yeah. Every little identity politics, LB, every LGBTQIA gets a little check mark, but uh, stock, braid, stock ban? No, oh, no, we can't have that whatsoever. That's what the priorities are in Washington right now. So, just goes to show you, uh, really just shows you how powerful that the people inside are fighting back against this. And yeah. remember, the average net worth in Congress is well over a million dollars. Most of these yeah. people are wildly, wildly, wildly rich and successful, which is great. It's a free country. And if you want to keep making money, don't run for Congress. If you actually want to serve, then you don't, then you have to give up that part. I mean, service, do we, do we, think about what we ask the people who sign up. For in the uniform. That's right. Right? Our service members, they get paid dog, like nothing. They don't get paid well. Their lives are subject to the whims of the military. They have all sorts of restrictions on what they can and can't do, even outside whenever they're off duty. But we recognize it as a service, and then we take care of them after they leave the uniform. Supposed to anyway. Why? Oh, yeah, well, yeah. we should. <laughs> Obviously, we don't do the best. Burn pits, you know, VA reform, et cetera. But there's a social contract. Now with Congress, we don't seem we seem to have thrown all of that mm-hmm. completely out of the window and let these people become wildly rich. I mean, Nancy <clears throat> Pelosi and her husband have increased her net worth by something like a hundred million dollars since she first entered office. That's crazy town. It, with active trading of options and things based upon things which are moving through Congress in which she's the Speaker of the House. It's ludicrous. Well, about I think happening. it's important to think about why there's been movement on this because it's so unlikely. Right, because yeah, this yeah. is something that actually impacts like directly members of Congress's mm-hmm. ability to cash on in on their position. So why is there any movement on this thing whatsoever? And I think when the the snowball really started to pick up speed was actually when Kevin McCarthy said, "Hey, we're going to run on this in the midterms." Yes, you know? that's right. And whether or not they're full of shit or have any credibility on like corruption ethics whatsoever, the fact that there was this horseshoe, bipartisan, populist outrage about this thing. Mm -hmm. That's what made this movement so powerful. Because if it was just on the right, then Democrats would just dismiss it and ignore it. If it was just on the left, then Democrats would also just dismiss it and ignore it because they're perfectly content to like stick it to their own base all day long. But since you had it coming from all parts of the political spectrum, it made it very difficult ultimately for them to resist and also made it so that, you know, some of these members realized that it was to their political benefit to try to get out in front of it Mm -hmm. and be the face of some sort of reform effort ultimately here. So that's what made it so incredibly powerful. And, you know, I'm talking in my monologue today about um, Christian Small's Amazon Labor Union going on with Tucker Carlson and the freak out over that. But if you really want to have something that actually happens in this country, you have to have a movement that brings in some different ideological perspectives. That's the only way you ultimately really can put pressure on these people. Otherwise, they just respond to their donor base, and that's that. So I think that has been such a critical part of why there's actually been movement, why you've just had the first ever House hearing, why you have so many different versions of this bill, why the provisions are being debated right now. It's one of the few like hopeful things within the actual political system. And so to study this and understand how this all went down is so important. So I think the two key moments are Nancy Pelosi mask off saying, well, it's a free market. Mm -hmm. That comes because she actually subjected herself to some question, get asked the right question, and actually says what she thinks, which creates this large level of outrage. That causes the right to jump in on it. Kevin McCarthy saying, we're running on this on the midterms. And then you were kind of off to the races to put forward some kind of proposal that people are going to respond well to and feel like you were actually somewhat responsive to their needs. Yeah, it's, it really is just an amazing, amazing story uh, that we should all, once again, shout out to Unusual Whales. He's the guy who started this whole thing, and uh, we owe him a very big debt. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing, and they know it. 
That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.